Well, hello and welcome to Understand Men Now. I'm Jonathan Asley of jonathanasley.com, and I'm so excited to be doing this live stream for you today. Our topic, shoot, I forgot what the topic is. How to make a man see you like the one and only. <laughs> really quickly, if you're brand new to my YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you can be notified of new videos. And if any time during this video, the content resonates with you, please hit that like button so I can be seen in the YouTube algorithms. Uh, really quickly, my coaching is what I call heart-centered radical honesty. It's direct, a little tough love, and a lot of heart. And occasionally I use expletives to enhance a sentence. So if an F-bomb or two isn't your cup of tea, I suggest logging off right now. Lastly, these are my thoughts, my perceptions, my opinions. By no means do I suggest this is the truth. You have to decide the truth for yourself. I'm a bit of a contrarian, so my advice goes contrary to both public opinion and traditional expectations. So all I ask is you give it a chance. All right, let's talk about how to get to have someone see you as their one and only. You know, before we go there, I, I really want to address what I think is the pink elephant in the room. And that is that the dating process today is really, really dysfunctional. I mean, the complaints from both men and women alike is alarming. Their frustrations, mostly with the opposite sex and also the amount of effort that people put into the process. There are criticisms on both sides of the aisle. And I witness this repeatedly when I watch social media, when I'm watching videos. Um, it's it's fascinating to me. I'm I've lately I've gotten a little bit addicted to TikTok videos, and I can't believe how many videos are there on narcissisms and sociopaths and bad first dates and men do bad things and women do bad things. And I mean, it's no wonder. It's rather dysfunctional out there. We are being fed with so much negativity that it makes it very difficult to actually lean into one of the most important fundamentals of the actual process is that, and that is holding hope. It's becoming much harder to hold hope these days. And it's understandable why, because the reality is, is we are no longer meeting people who know us or know the people we know. And repeat that, we are no longer meeting people who know us or know the people we know. Think back a hundred years ago. Most likely anybody who ended up getting married, the people that dated, they grew up in a small town. You knew their parents, they knew your parents, you knew their friends, you knew the doctor, you knew, you know, you knew the, the gas station attendant, everybody knew each other. So there was a level of not just physical safety from that perspective, but more importantly, there was a level of emotional safety back then. There was an extreme level of emotional safety, which makes it very difficult today because most of the time we're meeting total strangers through these devices. And when we're meeting strangers, it's hard to feel not just physically safe, and I can't begin to express the importance of physical safety, but I'm talking about emotional safety. I'm talking about really feeling safe to be who you are, to be vulnerable, to be authentic, to be transparent. This is why lately I've been recommending everybody check out the book by Malcolm Gladwell called Talking to Strangers, Talking to Strangers. And this, I can't read the subtitle, please forgive me. What we should know about the people we don't know. Talking to strangers, what we should know about the people we don't know. Folks, these days when we're meeting people, and especially when there's long distance involved, uh, and I'm talking, I mean, people are now dating across continents with each other they're not actually dating they're they're virtually hooking up in most cases it's a virtual connection usually based in many cases from an emotional place of feeling lack this is oftentimes this happens but i'm not suggesting that's all the cases and certainly when there's there's the long distance here in the united states of one end of the country versus the other and then there's just long distance when you leave 10 or, live 10 or 15 miles apart. And I'm only mentioning this is because how do we genuinely get to know someone when we have these long distances? And here's the challenge is it's very difficult to get to know someone through our devices. It's very difficult to get to know someone through text messaging and even telephone calls. I repeat, that's very difficult because think about it for a moment. I've had hundreds of thousands of hours of telephone calls in my life. I can't remember one telephone call. Well, 
actually, let me, let me scratch that. I only remember one telephone call I ever got in my life. And that was the one where my ex-wife called me to tell me that my son had passed away. And those who know me know my 19 year old son, Connor, there he is there. There's the little cutie pie there. And there he is there at graduation. And so all of these telephone calls don't actually help us bond with another human being. It doesn't help us bond. So it's really important to get physically face to face with someone so you can actually get to know them on a deeper level. And it's important to ask better questions in the process instead of the current dating rhetoric is, how's your day going? I hope you have a good day. Did you have a blessed day? Most people are talking about how wonderful their day is instead of getting to the heart of why are we even engaging with one another? Why are we even doing this? And there's this there's this misconception that everybody's on the same page. And let me tell you something, most everybody isn't on the same page. This is why it's important to ask questions. And because most humans believe chemistry equals relationship success, I'm gonna repeat that, chemistry equals relationship success, they're, they're actually finding themselves um, more disappointed than any ever before. And if you're not familiar with my relationship iceberg chart, I'm going to put it up on the screen. You can see above the water line is the word attraction. And you can see the tip of the iceberg is chemistry. But below the water line is compatibility, which says shared values, blendable lifestyles, and most importantly, emotional maturity. If you genuinely want to be in a relationship, that's then it is imperative to understand that chemistry doesn't equal relationship success. And yet we are so driven by chemistry and romance in the early stages, because in many cases, particularly for men, we are driven by lust or limerence, lust or limerence. And what that means is we either want to fuck you or we're just extremely infatuated with you based on putting you up on a pedestal. And that is not a healthy way to approach a relationship. This is why if you follow my work and you know my rhetoric, I always say the same thing. Before the penis goes inside the vagina, purchase two copies of the book, Eight Dates by Drs. John and Julie Gottman. Purchase two copies of this book and study this and read it together. This will actually build the intimacy, the intimacy that actually will start shifting this dynamic between the two of you to something where you really do look at someone as their one and only. So I want to share something with you as I was preparing for this uh, video. My coffee mug says coffee tastes better when shared. Um, by the way, I'm just drinking lemonade. Coffee tastes better when shared. When I was preparing for this, I was actually thinking of the movie When Harry Met Sally, When Harry Met Sally. And for those of you that know the movie, I'm going to give you a quick recap of it because there's some four key points that I want to bring up today that will help put you in that space of being someone's one and only. What was unique about this movie, there were two people that met uh, driving cross country and they found themselves not very particularly liking one another. And then a few years ago, a few years later, they run into each other and they were both in relationship at this point. And they still didn't like each other. And then about 10 years had passed from their original meeting and uh, they met up and they and they're both uh, single at this point. So they decided to build a friendship with one another. They built a friendship with one another. Now, what I love about this story, it's a classic example of two people being genuine with each other, being genuine with each other because there was no agenda in the process. So what I like was that each one of them was comfortable in their own skin, comfortable in their own skin. By the way, I have my notes, comfortable in their own skin. And in addition, what was unique about them was that they were radically honest with each other about their feelings. They were radically honest with each other about their feelings. And, and even if I want to piggyback on that, they were also their true genuine self. And there was something very unique about Sally for those who remember her, she was very neurotic in the way she ordered food. 
Um, she was, you know, I'd like to have the, the meatloaf, but if the gravy, I'd like to have a, the gravy in a cup on the side, and I'd like to have the Caesar salad, but if it has croutons, I'd like you to put it on the left corner of the plate, and I'd like to have the pie a la mode, but if you don't have vanilla ice cream, then I want cherry pie instead of apple pie, and I want it heated, but if you can't have it heated, then I want a chocolate bar instead, and Harry's looking at her and like, oh my God, she is insane. She is neurotic but she was just comfortable in her own skin. And more importantly, the two of them were radically honest with each other. They actually shared their genuine feelings with one another. And in addition to that, you know, as they built this friendship up, they genuinely cared for one another. They genuinely cared for one another. They were looking out for one another as if they were, you know, like, I've got your back, I've got your back. And lastly, they finally met each other where they're at. And what I mean to say is when they end up getting into a fight in this dynamic, Harry realized how much he cared for her. And what he realized most was he didn't like all the great qualities that she had, that she was attractive and cute and charming and that sort of thing. He liked those qualities in her that were weird, that, she, you know, at the end of the movie, he says, I love it that it takes you an hour and a half to order a ham sandwich. I love it that you think 71 degrees is cold. I love it that you're the first person I think of when I get up in the morning and you're the last person I think of when I go to bed. And when he realized, um, when he realized how much he cared for her, he realized she was the one and only, and he rushed over her over to her during uh, New Year's Eve to tell her. So what's the moral of the story here, and how does this relate to your relationship, whether you're currently dating with someone or you just you're looking to date someone in the future? I think what's really challenging today as I started this broadcast is that fact that we're meeting total strangers today. And in that, because the current dating process is hyper-focused on romance, on romance leading relationship success, I always believe that romance should be reserved for once you're in a relationship, not as a precursor to be in a relationship. Let me repeat that. Not as a precursor to be in a relationship. And what lesson we can learn from Sally, most importantly, is that she operated from her sovereign self. She was comfortable in her own skin. She wasn't trying to impress him. She wasn't trying to shift his perspective. She was just being her authentic self. And it's as if she read my book. And if you're not familiar with my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? By the way, there's a link below to all the books I recommend. It's a journey of personal development, self-help, and spiritual work. So we can lean into finding our genuine, authentic self. And that's what Sally did. And there's something incredibly attractive about that when a person is just being their true authentic self, warts and all. In other words, the way she ordered food. And, and by the way, Harry had his own, you know, uh, misogynistic uh, qualities that probably wouldn't be acceptable today. In fact, most movies uh, produced 30 or 40 years ago aren't, don't seem to be acceptable today. But, but, and, not but, and, certainly in our current times, ultimately it's about being our th authentic self. Now, here's the thing about self-worth. A lot of people lean into their self-worth from an egoic, entitled place. There are so many women. The biggest complaint by men is that so many women are acting from an entitled place. And at the same token, there's so many women operating from a doormat place. So we have the bookends, entitled in one end and book or doormat the other. Ultimately, I want you to sift through all that dysfunctionality and find your genuine, authentic self and show up in that capacity in your relationship. So coming back to my book, chapter one is speak your truth, do it with kindness. Speak your truth, do it with kindness. And eventually, later on in the book, there's a chapter called, if it's sincere and from the heart, you can't say the wrong thing to the right person. Ladies, I want to encourage you, stop giving your power away to men. I know you love the idea of you can just sit back in your feminine energy and the guy is going to claim you, but just recognize this. Most men are bad at the dating process. This is why you are in charge of your relationship destiny. And what I encourage all my clients to do is lead by example. Lead by example. 
And I know this is scary and this is tough. And it's very difficult to be genuinely vulnerable. I understand that because it's a, it feels like a huge risk. This is why I want everybody to check out this new book I just er, purchased. I just got it today, but it's called Emotional Intimacy. I, I'm going to put on my glasses. Emotional Intimacy, a comprehensive guide for connecting with the power of your emotions. A comprehensive guide to connecting to the power of your emotions. Why is this so critically important? Ladies, I recognize you think men are either emotionally dysfunctional or weak or unavailable, which is true. But women, you ladies are no better at this, you know, either. Just because you can vomit your emotions to your girlfriends and you have an outlet to vomit your emotions doesn't mean in relationship you have a healthy relationship skills. Let me repeat that. A lot of you think just because you can express your emotions to your girlfriends doesn't mean that you actually have the skill set to actually be in a healthy, happy relationship from a healthy communication standpoint. In fact, most communication comes from a very victim consciousness and a very violent way. This is why um, Marshall Rosenberg wrote the book Nonviolent Communication. Marshall Rosenberg, Nonviolent Communication, and why I'm recommending this book is to actually learn to communicate your emotions in a healthier way. And with this book, Emotional Intimacy, when you're actually dating someone, you should be reading these books together. Ladies, don't let the penis go inside the vagina until you've actually vetted one another to determine if you're on the same page. I'm gonna give you three quick questions you can ask a guy right from the get-go to determine this. What do you want in a relationship? Not do you want a relationship? What do you want in a relationship? Number one. Number two, what does a relationship mean to you? That's a really powerful question. What does a relationship mean to you? And lastly, why should I consider dating you? Why should I consider dating you? And folks, both of you better be answering these questions together because you have to show up you know, confident within yourself to describe why should he should date you and you should ask him, why should you, why should he date you and why should you date him? I think these are really radical questions to ask. Well, some people might say, well, Jonathan, that's crossing my boundaries. That's way too personal. Folks, we don't have time to fuck around. Let me tell you what's really personal. When you fuck on the first, second or third date and the person ghosts you, that's really personal, okay? So why not ask some deeper questions before you go down the romance path? I know it feels good. It feels good to be romanced. I know it makes you feel worthy, but ultimately romance isn't an indication of relationship success. Real bonding with one another, saying, I've got your back, I'm here, you matter, we are important. I've got your back, I'm not going anywhere and I only want you. That is the core to relationship success and that's what I invite you all to begin to lean into. So to recap this conversation before we take questions, I just wanna remind you, be comfortable in your own skin, be radically honest with one another. Uh, what else did I share? Genuinely, Choose someone where you genuinely care about each other's feelings and meet each other at the middle. Meet each other at the 50-yard line. Or as I always say, look at a relationship like a two-lane street where you're both making effort mutually. And hopefully, and I say hopefully because there are no guarantees in life, this person that you're with will see you as the one and only. And my hope is you get to see him as the one and only as well. Has this helped at all? If it has, please give me an amen. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we're going to take questions in a second. If you're brand new to my channel, there's a chat. If you're on the live stream right now, there's a chat box. Um, you can post the post, write the word question, post the question there after, or purchase a super sticker, super chat. There's a dollar sign there. Uh, in the super sticker, super chat, uh, the Funds from that goes to a scholarship fund in the name of my son, Connor Asley, who passed away a few years ago. And again, that's a picture of, those are some pictures of him right there. Um, the scholarship fund is to help defray the costs of personal development for those who seek personal development help and to donate to those personal development causes that I believe are quite worthy, which include the Hoffman process or insight. 
So we're going to take questions now. By the way, I got a question before we got started. So while I'm waiting for questions to come in and don't forget to purchase a super sticker, super chat. Oh, and if you're listening to the audio portion, you won't be able to do so. This question came in. So I want to share this with everyone. All right. <laughs> my sweater is a little off. Uh, Jonathan. Oh, wait, let me keep my glass on. Jonathan, there's a guy I met and I'm feeling really anxious because I like him. What to do? Jonathan, there's a guy I met. I'm feeling really anxious. I like this guy. What do I do? Oh, my God, I love this question. And it kind of reminds me of a conversation I had with one of my monthly clients yesterday. She has a propensity to get anxious in the early stages of dating. And we were talking about managing her emotions during this time. And I thought I would share what's actually happening to me right now as we speak. So I'm going to share something personal and to help illustrate what to do when you're feeling anxious. So now let me just be candid with everyone. I, If you're not familiar with love attachment style, I highly recommend check out, checking out the book Attached by Amir Levine and Rachel Heller. Amir Levine and Rachel Heller. Love attachment, uh, there's basically three types of love attachment. There's anxious, and then there's some versions of anxious in there. There's avoidant, and then there's secure. Anxious, avoidant, secure. Anxious are needy people. Avoidant are kind of emotionally closed off people. And secure are people that can lean into a relationship. Okay, so just giving you the concept of that. I personally have what's known as a anxious love attachment style. That means, and what we typically do is when we're an anxious, we tend to choose avoidant personalities. And when we're avoidant, we tend to choose anxious people. And what that means is I get highly, I get a ton of anxiety when I don't feel safe. Uh, in relationship. That's what happens to me. I get very, very anxious. And this is even true in the beginning stage of dating. And it's really fascinating to uh, witness my personality when I'm anxious. And this has just happened to me. So about 10 days ago, um, or you know, nine or 10 days ago, I connected with someone through a dating app. I'll be candid with you. The dating app is called The League, The League. And if you're not familiar with it, I recommend checking it out. I'm currently on Bumble, Tinder, Hinge, uh, Match.com, Millionaire Match. I, I look at each one of them as the spoke in the wheel, as an opportunity to meet people I wouldn't otherwise meet in my daily life. I work from home, so I don't meet people in my daily life. So I use the dating apps as a vortex or a vehicle to meet someone. And I met this person on Hinge and we exchanged, you know, over the course of about four days, we exchanged a message with each other. And then, you know, and I was attracted to her photographs and I really appreciated the messages. And then we jumped on a phone call and we ended up having a two hour phone call and we really, really hit it off. I was like, I was really feeling like a, a sense of like a wow, like, you know, and, and I've had lots of telephone calls that didn't feel that way. And I've had other phone calls that have felt that way as well. And I found myself going to bed that night and I was feeling rather excited, rather excited. In fact, I had a hard time sleeping and she was currently traveling and she was she isn't going to she actually just returned today. Um, this was on Monday, our first phone call. And we had another phone call on Tuesday. And I noticed our communication styles was a little bit different when it came to organizing the telephone call. And I found myself getting incredibly anxious. Oh my God, what was going on inside my head? I was spinning out of control. I was spinning out of control. And then we didn't speak the next day, which was Wednesday. And then we jumped on the phone again on Thursday. And and I was it was it was fascinating to witness the feelings going on inside of me. Now, the old Jonathan, when I was feeling the, the mismatch in communication, I don't mean when we were actually on the telephone call. I'm talking about our communication just to organize the telephone call. Felt um, I'm very demonstrative. I'm very effusive. I'm a flirt. And, and she's not that type. That's not her personality style. And for all I know, she's just being a little bit reserved because she doesn't know me. And the fact that I've gotten over infatuated isn't very uncommon. Now, you might have heard the term love bombing that men do. Listen, when a man is excited, 
we can go through an alliteration of different types of feelings when we feel excited. And certainly love bombing or planning the future is very common. You don't have to be a narcissist to do that. The garden variety, you know, red-blooded guy can be that way. And by the way, everything I'm sharing, a woman can feel this way as well. And so what was interesting when I got on the phone with my client on Thursday before I spoke to the, this woman, and by the way, we have a date planned on Sunday, uh, lunch date. And what was interesting when I shared with my client, because I knew she would appreciate this, and I shared almost exactly what I just shared with you. And as I was sharing it to her, she goes, oh my God, Jonathan, I so resonate with that. I knew she would because we've had these conversations before. Now, what she pointed out and what was interesting, in fact, she pointed this out earlier before we had the conversation, was the idea of awareness, awareness. I was aware of my emotions. I was aware of my emotions. So... The old Jonathan, when there was a mismatch in communication, I would have kept trying harder, trying harder, trying harder, trying harder. Now, you've heard the term chasing someone. Chasing someone is when you are trying harder than them. I'm going to repeat that. Chasing someone is when you try harder than them. And I had to really sit with my emotions. So, so I sat with my emotions and did nothing other than spin out of control inside of myself. Now you would think, gosh, with all the personal development work done, work done, work I've done, how could this happen? I'm a red, I'm a red-blooded human being like everyone else. As much work as I've done to heal my childhood wounds and traumas and my adult traumas and my negative patterns and limiting belief, at the core, I'm still a red-blooded human being. And my default love attachment style is is anxious. So First, and 80% of this is awareness. I was just really aware of my feelings. And I was able to articulate my feelings to my client to help demonstrate this, just as I am with you. And I'm in a, the one benefit I do come to is a place where I can actually articulate my feelings from a non victim based consciousness. I'm going to repeat that the non victim based consciousness. Sadly, most human beings communicate their feelings very much from a victim orientation. Women, you do this, men do this. And this is one of the reasons why couples are butting heads with each other because they're not communicating in a healthy emotional way. Now, to piggyback on this, so 80% is awareness. What I told my client is 10% is navigating your emotions. In other words, I didn't vomit my feelings with her. I didn't, um, I didn't uh, try to force the situation. I stayed contained in my feelings. And then here's what I want to share for this uh, person that wrote in. What I did afterwards was take inspired action. So we end up getting on the phone last night, and as we were talking with one another, and again, we're planning our date, and we're just getting to know each other, she actually asked me a really personal question. She asked about my childhood, which I think is a great question to ask someone to get a sense and, and uh, get us, because we had talked about doing therapy, and we talked about personal development and such. She asked about my childhood, which I really appreciated, and I said, um, and I'll just uh, um, her nickname is Minnie Mouse. Um, <laughs> my Pilates instructor nicknamed her Minnie Mouse because she's got this interesting quality of a very like girl next door kind of voice to her, which uh, which I really appreciate. And I said to Minnie Mouse, I said, um, I have something very vulnerable to share with you. Is that okay? I have something very vulnerable to share with you. Is that okay? Now, the rule book would say, never do what I'm about, what I did. The rules would never say this, but I love myself enough to know I can say anything because if it's sincere and from the heart, I can't scare the wrong person away. And what I did was I shared the feelings I was experiencing. And what happened next floored me. That didn't really floor me. I actually, I think I had a sense I knew how she would respond. She was so grateful, so appreciative of me sharing my feelings. And she even let on that she had a little bit of a crush for me. And I, I mean, I'm saying this in a tiny sense, not a crush, but that she genuinely liked me. 
And she said that she liked me even more because I was vulnerable, authentic, and transparent. Now, I know another, a lot of my male contemporaries out there, not necessarily contemporaries in the dating coaching business, would call me a wimp. They'd call me a simp. They'd call me a pussy. They'd call me uh, pandering to women. Here's the thing. Vulnerability takes courage. Vulnerability takes courage. Radical honesty takes courage. There is nothing wimpy, wussy, pussy, whatever terminology some people would use. There is nothing weak about sharing how you feel. And the right person actually leans into the conversation with you and the wrong person runs away. Ladies, you can actually be vulnerable, authentic, and transparent with someone. And the right person will appreciate it. And you will only scare the wrong person away. So coming back to this original question, uh, where did it go? Jonathan, there's a guy I met and I'm, I'm feeling really anxious because I like him. What do I do? You know what you do? First, be aware of your feelings. Next, that's 80% of it. Be aware of your feelings. 10% is managing your feelings. And then lastly, take inspired action, whatever that looks like for you. And it might not be doing anything. In my case, I shared my feelings. And my hope is that she actually is getting to know me at an intimate level, at an intimate level. And I don't mean sexual intimacy. I mean emotional intimacy. Into me, you see. Into me, you see. Because ultimately, if you want to be someone's one and only, you're going to have to reach that level of emotional intimacy. And as I recommended this book earlier, Emotional Intimacy, if you really want to experience a juicy, delicious, happy relationship, it's time to get radically honest with people because the current dating process of chasing chemistry and using romance for uh, as the indicator of relationship success isn't working. It isn't working and it isn't going to going forward. What's going to happen is it's going to require being a little bit contrarian than the normal person out there. At least that's my invitation for you. I want to thank that person for the question once again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Giving you a big, gigantic hug for that one. Allowed me to share my own feelings. All right. We're going to just take one more question for the day because my neck is hurting right now. Question, what's your advice? He wants to move in together, but he doesn't want to lose his freedom. So I suggested staying at hotels some nights, days by myself, by, by himself. Coco, this is a great question. In fact, I know a couple who uh, is married. Uh, they got married in their late 60s. In fact, this is her first marriage and this is his second marriage. Uh, they're about a year apart in age. And they uh, they got engaged about eight months after dating. They moved, uh, I think they moved in together around that time. They got married about 13 months after they met. And they found out that uh, the spending 20, and they're both retired. So spending 24 seven has been very stressful to them. So they made an arrangement where eat once a week, each one of them leaves the house, you know, sometime around 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and goes off and does their own thing. While the person staying in the house does their own thing. And they come back around five or six in the evening, give or take. And I'm sure it's not a rigid uh, system that they have, but it's a loose system of about eight or nine hours apart. Gives them space. And they do it, I think, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. One goes out of the home and the other person goes out of the home. I'm not sure I'd be you know, inclined to go to an apartment. That's a rather expensive um, proposition. I mean, you certainly can do that. Um, or maybe you can just get a crash pad. That's one possibility. The thing about losing freedom, you know, when someone feels like a relationship is constrictive and restrictive, then it's possible that they may not be capable of a live-in type of arrangement. And a lot of couples these days are doing something. Hold on, everyone, for a second. A lot of couples are doing the following. They're doing something called living together apart, living together apart. And Coco, you may want to check out this book called Living Together Apart 
which is a it's a really short book. It's a tiny little book. It's an easy guide to navigating a relationship where you're actually living in separate residences. And in fact, a lot of couples are choosing this as their method of being in relationship and being very aware of it. So they're, they basically have made a commitment to be with one another, but they don't live together. I have a friend um, who's currently uh, have, have been in that kind of relationship for three years, three and a half years, and they're actually now finally moving in together. But it took a lot of work to get there. And they, they read this book as a precursor to help them navigate some of the challenges that happens when two people either live together or don't live together. So I highly recommend checking out this book, Coco. All right. So thank you so much for that question. Um, and I hope that helped. All right. I'm just going to scroll through here real quick. Folks, my neck is, I've got a little pinched neck right now. So it's going to be hard for me to continue. But I want to read some of these comments. Um, a lot of people are saying, amen. Thank you so much. Uh, amen. 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 It's resonating. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, I hope you appreciated my personal share as well. Um, you know, I hope you appreciated that one. And listen, we're going to wrap up today. It's Friday. I want you all to go out and have a fantastic time this weekend. Um, and my hope is this content resonates with you. My hope is you're looking at relationships from a different perspective, not from the old narrative that romance and chemistry equals relationship success. What I'm encouraging everyone is to be radically honest, be comfortable in your own skin, be more deliberate, more intentional, because that has a greater chance of relationship success than the way most people are doing it. And that's winging it, winging it, winging it. And I don't want you to wing it anymore. Are you on board with that? I hope you are. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. Um, and again, uh, please purchase a super sticker, super chat the next time so we can build up that Connor Aslake scholarship fund. All right. I'm going to wrap up this video as I always do. First off, give myself a big gigantic Jonathan Bear hug of self-love. I'm going to reach into the camera and give you a hug of love if that's okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to someone, a pet, a teddy bear, a pillow, and give it or them a hug of love because hugs are a great source of love. And let's face it, we could all use more love in our lives. Thanks a bunch. Bye now. Let's say goodbye to Teresa and Jazz and Glenn and Jane and Kimberly and Michelle. Thank you all for being on. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye now.